you'll turn to Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, beginning verse 37, Jesus has just instructed His audience that there would be a reckoning, that there would be a gathering together, that there would be a division of sheep and goats. And verse 34, He says, The King shall say unto them on His right hand, Come ye blessed of My Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the, of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came not unto me. But in verse 37, the audience asks the question, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And verse 40, Jesus says, The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now as was pointed out in this morning's sermon and in perhaps many sermons before, Jesus takes great concern on all individuals. And from God's perspective, He does not look at individuals from a perspective of being great or small. He looks at all individuals from the standpoint of, an in, of one who can be saved. One who He wants to know the truth in order that they might be obedient to Him so that they can be saved. So when words like these are mentioned, they're used for our understanding, for our learning, for our admonition. They are used so that we can understand it from man's perspective. Jesus said, when you do any of these things unto one of these, the least, one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. As if to say, you acknowledge that I'm Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And obviously then, if you agree to that and you believe that, you're going to do all you can to take care of my needs. But Jesus says when you take care of one of these who uh, is considered in the world as one of the least of these, not the greatest, not the King Himself, not the Son of God Himself, but when you do these things to one of the least of these, you have done it even unto Me. Insomuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, My brethren, you have done it unto Me. Now this aspect and idea of the least is one that Jesus presents in many different forms and aspects throughout His ministry and throughout apostolic age in, in writing the New Testament. The idea of least. And it's not limited to just individuals as is the case here. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of these, the least of My brethren, it's also used in reference to any way in which man or the world considers something to be greater or far greater or far better and something else to be far worse or far less. And it almost always is the case that when man places the priority or when man places the value, it seems to be different than the value placed on it than Jesus. As is the case here, Jesus said... One of the least of these in the world, in the eyes of the world, is as great as the Son of God Himself. Doing it under the Son of God Himself. The act, whatever that act is, and some are mentioned here, if you were to do it to the Son of God, it would be just as great to do it to someone nobody ever heard of or knew. And I think we can apply that too to, to not just individuals, but when we do acts, works on behalf of the Lord. Obviously, uh, those acts have to be scripturally authorized. But when we do things that are authorized by God, 
the world may see certain things as being greater or better or more important than other things. Whereas God sees them all equally because they are necessary or they are good to bring about His desire. And that is that individuals know the truth and obey the truth. We see this in different areas. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this principle that I think I'm trying to share with you is, is written like this to the church at Corinth. A congregation that had numbers of people and great amounts of money that they could help others who were in need. And in 1 Corinthians, we find that they had made a promise to send financial help to a congregation that was in need that uh, at that time could not take care of itself or the need that it had. In 2 Corinthians 8, we find that Paul is telling them, you promised to send this money, but as of this writing, you have not yet sent it. And so in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, primarily for our purpose, he says this, for if there be first a willing mind, and of course at that time there was a willing mind, they said, yeah, we're going to help. We're going to take care of this need. It is accepted according to the man hath and not according to that, that he hath not. In other words, individuals may have a willing mind, but if they don't have the ability or the means to help, God doesn't require it of them. But later in this text we find that Corinth had the ability, had the means, and at one time had the willing mind. But the willing mind had dissipated. So they still had the means and the ability, but not the willing mind. So Paul here is encouraging them to get back into the willing mind and do what you said you would do. Perform the act that you said that you would perform. The principle here for us though in looking at the idea of the least of these is not the congregation that had great things or had the ability, but that one, the willing mind was necessary. And two, God doesn't require us to do more than we have the ability to do. Notice again verse 12, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. Now, in this same passage, Paul tells the church one of the reasons that you help is so that one day that congregation can get on their footing and help others. So the, so the point is not you keep supporting them, but support them now while they need it so that at some time they can support others. Not that they're supposed to be draining you all the time. There's a time when you quit draining and you start supplying, you see. You, support, you start doing the, the addition. And that's part of this, the idea of Christianity is we help one another, we bear one another's burdens. We help one another get to a point where each, other, each individual can bear his own burden and then help others. A Christian shouldn't always stay at the same spot or at the same location. But the principle here is that God doesn't require us to do more than what we have the ability to do. Therefore, it may be the case that we, in our work for the Lord, may do things that are not seen. Maybe they are things that individuals don't know about. But if they are to the good or to the good of the work of the church or to help others, and though it may not be seen as great in the eyes of the world or even great in the sight of uh, other individuals, it is seen as good in the eyes of God because we're doing with what we have. Now that principle obviously is seen in uh, the parable of the talents, right? In Matthew uh, chapter 25, verse 21, we read of a man who had five talents and he was told, Well done! We are told in verse 23 that a man who had two talents was told, well done. Now why were they told, well done? Because the man with five talents took what he had and he did with it as up to his abilities. 
And we find that the man with two talents, even though that wasn't as great as the man with five talents, took what he had and with his abilities doubled it and made four talents. And they were both told well done, even though one had more and did more in the sight of the world, you see. In the eyes of the world, we might say, well, the man with four talents did less or inasmuch as one of the least of these. You see, we'd say he's the least of these. God didn't say he's the least of these. What did God say? Well done. He said, well done to both of them. Now guess what he would have said to the man with one talent? If the man with one talent would have taken what he had and with his ability done what he should have done or what he could have done, not what he couldn't do, but what he could have done, the Lord would have said to the man with one talent, well done. The same exact thing. So whereas the world or individuals, and we, we perhaps we fall into this uh, trap of seeing things not like the Lord does and say, well, these are least. These are the least of these. Whereas this will be the greatest of things. We need to associate our things with the greater, the bigger, the larger. The Lord says, don't, don't worry about what you don't have. Deal with what you have and do it to the best of your abilities. And the man with five talents did that. The man with two talents did that. The man with one talent lied and failed, not because he couldn't do it, but because he chose not to. He then was seen as unfaithful. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Peter says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now we quote this many times, but notice this. If any man minister, now the word minister means to serve. If any man minister, let him do it how? As of the ability which God giveth. Right? Do what you can do with what you have. Do it to the best of your ability. Don't do it to the least of your ability. Don't do it to the weakest of your ability. Take what you've got, whether you think it's small or not, and do the greatest you can with it. If we speak, do it as the oracles of God. Don't speak where God didn't speak. And if you minister or serve, do it as the ability of God gives you. Now somebody might say, well, I don't have any ability at all. Wrong. (laughs) Wrong. You have some ability to do something. Do it. And do it to the best of your ability. Notice in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 40, beginning. Jesus says, He that receiveth you receiveth Me, and he that receiveth Me receiveth him that sent Me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. But notice verse 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones, right, someone uh, insignificant, one of the least of these, cold water, a cup of cold water, only, In the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Just giving someone a cup of cold water. Right? Giving someone a cup of cold water. On a hot day, boy, that could be just what a person needs. Right? (laughs) It's not anything great. It's nothing out of the ordinary. It's not beyond what you have. Someone might say, "Well, if I had a a turkey and a you know a gallon of sweet tea, I'd I'd have invited that individual in for dinner. Why don't you just offer him what you got? (laughs) Won't you just give him a cup of cold water? Maybe that's all he needs. Maybe he didn't need turkey. Maybe he didn't need any sweet. Maybe he just needed a cup of cold water. Offer him that cup of cold water." Some people would say, "Well, that's one of the least, that's a little thing." We did, we, and you know how many little things go undone because people say, "Well, that's too little." There's not enough cup of cold water given out, is there? <laughs> Needs more cups of cold water. And in the passage that we began in Matthew 25, some of the things there are mentioned are easy. 
in some form or fashion. He says, when I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came into me. Basically, when an individual has a need, the need was addressed, wasn't it? That's all there was to it, wasn't it? It wasn't anything huge. It wasn't anything big. It wasn't looking for something to do. It was simply there was a need. And the need was authorized to be fulfilled. And an individual could fulfill it or the church itself could fulfill it. But primarily, I'm speaking from individuals, individuals can take care of that need. Give a cup of cold water. Give someone a meal. Visit someone. Send a card. Uh, send one of our brochures, little things that nobody sees. Now how much good do those do? Hopefully they do a great deal of good. They may do no good. <laughs> I don't know. But they are little things in the sight of man that could do great things. Right? We have brochures that we can send out introducing people to the church of Christ. We have brochures that can introduce people uh, or we our come study with us brochures. You can send people cards. Sometimes people say, well, I don't have the ability to, to talk one-on-one. Well, don't talk one-on-one. Put a stamp on it and send it. You know, you can say a, it's easier a lot of times to say things in a card anyway. Invite people to services. Let people know you're concerned about their soul. Let people know you care about them. These are little things that individuals can do. It's not above what they're able to do. It's offering simply the cup of cold water on a hot day. In Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, and I used this passage not too long ago dealing with the burial of Jesus and lessons there, but one of the reasons it stuck out in my mind, I'm going to use it again. Mark chapter 14, verse 3, the Bible says, "...they were in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on Jesus' head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And we recall that in a parallel passage, one of the murmurers was Judas. And he could care less about the poor. He was a thief. He wanted to steal it. But notice that some of the disciples, what they what happened here from their standpoint, they had indignation within themselves and said, "Why was this waste of ointment made?" Somebody might say, "Well, why are we wasting time sending out brochures or sending cards or giving somebody a cup of cold water or whatever the case is? These little things." Perhaps the little thing, cleaning the building to make sure we have a nice, comfortable place to worship and for our visitors to, to feel invited. We have people that do that and we thank them. We have an individual who makes the bread uh, that we partake of in regards to the Lord's Supper. What a blessing that is. We have an individual who does our bulletins. What a blessing that is. Little things that perhaps sometimes go unseen. But they're worthy and good. And and if you want to help in one of those things, you don't really need to ask. Just go do something, right? Those are things you can just go do. But notice here, in Mark 14, the way people saw it. With indignation in it, that's sad. They were sorry. They had a bad attitude about it. But notice Jesus' (laughs) attitude about it. Let her alone. She hath wrought a good work. On me. That's what Jesus said. Jesus, they saw it as what a waste. And Jesus said, it's a good work. 
Now this is something today people would think, well that's not a good that's not what we're talking about when we say what can we do more of? Well why not? Jesus thought it was a good. Because it's not big enough for you, it's not great enough for you, it's not giving you enough prestige or enough name recognition. Why is it? Why not do something small? Jesus said it was good. Keep your put a marker there or, or keep your finger there because we're going to come back there here in just a moment. And turn over just a few pages to Mark 16. Another passage I used not too long ago dealing with something else, but I wanted to use this for for application today. Mark 16, the Bible says in verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed, remember Jesus had died and been buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint Him. Now, Jesus is already dead. <laughs> he didn't need any ointments. He didn't need any spices, right? Notice verse 2 what these women thought. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week. You know, it's hard to, do any, hard to get people motivated to do anything early in the morning on the first day of the week. Isn't it? Folks, we need to be dedicated and motivated to get up on the first day of the week early to come worship God. These women got up very early in the morning. Why? Because they cared. That's pretty much why. They came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Could you imagine if we started our services before the sun got up? Somebody would be here, I guarantee it. Verse 3, And the women said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Now notice, the women here saw something they could do. It wasn't huge. It wasn't enormous. Nobody else was going to see it. They didn't have to ask, is there something we can do? They, didn't have to, they just saw something. Hey, let's do this. And, and some might have said, well, that's worthless. It's not going to do any good. But you know, it showed their love and devotion for the Lord even after His death that they cared about how He was presented in that tomb. And they brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. They had they saw a need. It wasn't a huge need. In fact, if it it didn't really need to be done because he wasn't there. <laughs> but nonetheless, it really wasn't needed in the sense of he had to have it because he was dead. But it was something they saw that they could do from their standpoint. And what did they do? They did it. They went to do it. And they were dedicated. They were motivated so much so that they got up very early in the morning to go do it. They had initiative. They saw something that they wanted to do. There was nothing wrong with doing it. There was nothing unauthorized or unscriptural doing it. It was just something they could do for the Lord. And so they did it. And in every aspect, in every instance we see, that's what happens. When it's even if it's one of these least of these types of things, people see something that needs to be done, they want to do it, and they go do it. Now we've already, in some ways, looked at how the Lord looks upon these little acts, right? What we would call insignificant things. To the talent, to the man with five talents, to the man with two talents, God said, "Well done." That's how the Lord looks at it. Right? In Mark chapter 14, go back there where you had your marker placed. Jesus just says that this woman had done a good work. Look at verse 9. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. That is, that this good work is one that will go forth as an example of what other people can do as, as far as good works do. She shall be spoken of as a, for a memorial. Back up to Mark chapter 12. We read of a, a poor widow who did not have a great deal of money. Jesus saw her 
among the, the individuals who cast in money. Some had great deals of money and they cast in much. Verse 41. Verse 42, A certain widow came and she threw in two mites. And Jesus saw the opportunity to teach His disciples and said in verse 43, This poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. If it is the case that the Lord recognizes individuals for doing little and considering it great, isn't that good enough for us? Right? It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what others think. If the Lord thinks it's great, right? The Lord loved that two mites. The Lord loved the fact that this woman wanted to show her love and devotion to Him before He was to die and be buried. The Lord will not forget. The Lord will not forget. Your good deeds here on earth may be forgotten by some, maybe by all. But the Lord will not forget. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward His name and that ye have ministered to the saints and continue to minister. And then of course in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Paul by inspiration encourages us Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord. Not big things, great things only, but anything that can be seen as the work of the Lord. Those things which are authorized that can bring about good for the cause of Christ, for His church, for others. Abound in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we need to do is think on what we can do and not what we can't do. Think on things that might be available to do rather than say there's nothing to do. Consider our abilities and recognize that we can do more than we probably think we can do. (laughs) Do not sit sedentary, but take advantage of those abilities that the Lord has given us. Take the initiative to do those things whereas they are appropriate in the Lord's work. Do it out of love. and Do it out of devotion. Do it to develop faithfulness in self, not to be seen of others. Doing it as a labor of love for the Lord. There are many little things that can be done, and the answer, the truth is that they are not little. They are not little in the eyes of God, and they are not little in the eyes of many of your brethren. Little things that get done around here are appreciated, and any time any individual wants to do, then do. And don't think that you've not done enough if you've done. Continue to do what you see needs to be done as is authorized by God. Continue to look for opportunities to do things and continue to use your abilities for the work of the Lord. If you have not yet obeyed the Gospel of Christ and your works are not being accounted as righteousness, you have an opportunity today to believe the Lord and obey His Gospel to be added to His church to be among the saved. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith leads us to act appropriately to repent of our sins. Luke 13, 3, to confess the deity of the Christ. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and then be baptized into Christ where we have all of our sins washed away. Acts 22, verse 16. Where the Lord adds us to His church. Acts 2, verse 47. Where we are saved from our past sins. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Once we rise up out of that watery grave to be a new creature, we live a new way. We live a new life. We put away the old life of sin and we live a new life. The life of a Christian. A life in faithfulness to the Lord. And if we are found faithful on the last day, 
God has promised to take us home with Him to heaven where we can live with Him in eternity. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have something else separating you from God, take care of that as, as you see fit, whether it be of a private nature or of a public nature. If we can help you, we're here to assist as we stand and sing.